So what, I, what I'd like to do is um, tell, tell you a little bit about how I'm thinking about the kind of convergence uh, between what is going on more on the human genetic side in trying to understand the uh, genetic basis of rare disease and what we perhaps traditionally thought of as the uh, PD side of uh, pharmacogenetics. And I think this is giving us kind of a new pathway in to understanding uh, the uh, inherited determinants of uh, drug response. So to set the stage, uh, we're all now, of course, very well aware uh, that there really have been remarkable advances in some aspects of medicine because of advances in genomics. Of course, uh, the advances have been hyped in some ways more than warranted, uh, but there have been remarkable advances. And perhaps the most remarkable advance uh, with clinical relevance is how genomics is changing diagnostics. And there are a number of therapeutic areas uh, where it really is essential to perform genomic-based uh, diagnostics. In some of these therapeutic areas, that really is very new. And these genomic-based diagnostic approaches uh, in some areas really are working better than I think we had any reason to expect that they should. Um, so the uh, paradigm that's often used for childhood diseases is to sequence, uh, typically currently a whole exome sequence, an affected child where available his or her parents as well, and then to look through the child's genome for genotypes uh, that ap appear as if they could uh, confer risk of a very serious disease. And of course, the fundament fundamental way we do that is look for genotypes that are of a type that either rarely or never occurs in the general population, and that's the fundamental paradigm. And if you actually look at this paradigm applied across a very broad range of different therapeutic areas, as I already alluded to, it really does work remarkably well. And I don't know how many geneticists will admit to this, but I will say when I was first thinking about this, my view was that if you start from a situation of knowing absolutely nothing about where a causal mutation is in a patient's genome, and all you have to go on is that a clinician assures you, even a clinician that you like and trust, a clinician assures you that there's a mutation to be found, but you know nothing else at all. You have no linkage information to tell you what part of the genome the mutation should be found in. You actually don't know from the presentation what kind of gene it is, so you don't have candidate genes. You actually have to look through the whole genome. Before this actually started being done, if you asked me, uh, I would have said, and in fact did say, if we got that right, once we could actually sequence, say, for example, exomes, one out of ten times, that would actually be remarkable. Because the genome is big, we all know it's stuffed full of variation, we know our ability to recognize important variation is limited, we all know that short read sequencing, uh, even though it's getting cheaper and cheaper and easier to do on scale, misses lots and lots of different types of, types of variants. For all these reasons, one out of ten would actually be pretty good. In fact, uh, that's what we were targeting when we first started doing this together with Fonda Nishashi many years ago. But if you actually look across therapeutic areas, the realized diagnostic yield varies between something like 25 percent and as high as 50 percent. The diagnostic yield means that you've started with the assumption that there is a causal mutation to be found, a mutation that strongly contributes to the presentation, and then you actually declare that you found a pathogenic variant. Now, of course, some fraction of those declarations that the pathogenic variant uh, has been found are false positives. But lots and lots of analyses make perfectly clear that the vast majority of those, when done carefully, are accurate, which means that we have in our hands a truly remarkable diagnostic test, and for lots and lots of therapeutic indications, this really now should be performed. That's the good news, okay? We can actually now transition to less good news. The way the press writes about precision medicine often will highlight this kind of thing to emphasize the progress and then imply, or in some cases state, that once you have these diagnoses, what that means is you get to go to the medicine cabinet now that you know the diagnosis, grab the right medicine for the patient, give them the medicine, and then everybody is happy. In fact, that storyline for how precision medicine works actually does happen, and it is a reason to do this genetic diagnostic work. Everybody that does this kind of work at scale has examples of where you start not knowing what a patient has, you do some genomics, now actually quite straightforward. You find out what the patient has, and then you know how to treat. Um, that happened to us uh, a number of times. The most exceptional case of that sort uh, is a patient uh, that is 
uh, pictured here for reasons I'll explain in a minute, named Kara Green. She presented um, at the Duke University uh, Hospital, uh, was seen by Vandana Shashi, a, a, a clinical colleague, um, and the clinical team uh, really did not have any idea what she actually had, uh, but they uh, saw very quickly that her condition was uh, progressive, and they in fact feared it was so progressive that she wouldn't live very long. So they decided to treat on the basis of it possibly being an autoimmune condition, but they also asked us to sequence her, in fact, as quickly as we possibly could. We'd actually just started uh, diagnostic sequencing research efforts at the time. So we sequenced her as quickly as we could, uh, and in fact, she had one of these genotypes that declare themselves with no ambiguity at all as being responsible for disease. Uh, and in fact, that's actually a, a not atypical outcome. Uh, we often see in these kind of diagnostic cases that a genotype is really clear or there's nothing. It's actually not that often where we have to scratch our heads. That happens, but it's actually less, less often. In any uh, event, in this case, we did not have to scratch our heads at all. It was a very, very clear genetic diagnosis that indicated that the patient had a very rare genetic disease that results from not making a transporter of a vitamin. And this treatment for this very rare genetic disease is to give the patient an awful lot of the vitamin. And the reason the picture is shown is that uh, the disease is characterized by exceptional upper, upper body weakness. Uh, Kara, in fact, when she fell over, was not able to raise her hands to uh, protect herself when she fell. And now we get regularly sent pictures uh, of her by her parents uh, happily lifting up her arms. So this is clearly what we are trying to do in precision medicine. This is definitely a very strong motivation to perform this kind of genomic work. I do, however, want to emphasize that there is a remarkable selection bias when you hear about these kinds of things because everyone who does this, does this at scale knows that this is really, truly exceptional. And I can actually show you exactly why it's exceptional if you just think about it for a minute. What's happening in situations like this is that you start with a patient where you don't know what they have, you do some genomics, and you work out, oh, actually, it's one of the approximately 4,000 genes that cause Mendelian diseases that's responsible for disease in this patient. That's what you've learned. That's the diagnosis for the patient. That's what's happening in these situations. Now, if you actually just go to those 4,000 genes and say, well, how many of them are treated or treatable like this is treatable? And the answer is a very, very small percentage. So it's actually perfectly clear on first principles that this has to be the exceptional outcome. It's really perfectly clear. So if we actually want precision medicine to advance and make a bigger difference in medicine, even for the rare diseases, I'm going to say something about the common diseases later, we have to actually make more of those 4,000 genes more like this one, where we actually have very good treatment options. Unfortunately, that's really, really hard to do. And all too often, what happens after a diagnosis based on sequencing is that you really do reach a therapeutic dead end. I do want to emphasize that this does not mean that there's no point to having done the genomics. And you often hear people talking about clinical implications of doing the genomics. Getting a genetic diagnosis is part of, I'm not a clinician, but I still take the view it's part of practicing good medicine. Patients often want to know why, so simply telling them why is often helpful to patients and families. There's, of course, counseling implications. But in terms of therapies, knowing the genetic diagnosis very often does not tell you what to do. If we really want to push precision medicine more broadly, make it more broadly available, then we have to actually take many more of these genetic conditions and figure out how to effectively treat them. So we've been thinking about putting in place a program that allows us to start with the genetics and think hard about what to do therapeutically. At Columbia, I'm going to now tell you a little bit about how we're doing that, which I think is, on the one hand, encouraging that this is something that is actually doable, but it's on the other hand sobering because the path uh, from a genetic diagnosis to a new therapy actually almost always runs through biology. So I'm going to try to convince you of, and when it runs through biology, we know. It means it's going to be hard and time consuming. That's just the way, the way that it works. Okay, so a little bit about what we've been doing. So uh, about three years ago, I moved from Duke to Columbia to start an institute for genomic medicine. The idea of the institute is really to practice genomics in as clinically applied a fashion as possible. So we've been sequencing patients that are seen at the medical center at Columbia for a few years now. Uh, I'm often asked about how we choose the patients that we sequence, and the answer is we don't choose them very carefully. And I actually think that's the right answer. So you often really can't tell whether a patient does or does not have an underlying genotype that's responsible for the presentation. And so I think being too strict about what patients should be sequenced is probably not the right thing to do. Sometimes uh, it's pretty clear 
that the type of disease is not really compatible with the kind of genetics that I'm describing. I won't list them, but there are diseases like that. And sometimes it's, it's relatively clear why a patient has a disease that is sometimes genetic. For example, epilepsy often has a strong genetic cause, but sometimes there's an explanation for the epilepsy that's readily apparent, such as a uh, brain tumor and so on. We try to exclude those kinds of cases, and we sequence just about everything else and try to perform careful evaluations to look for genetic diagnoses in all of these other cases. Here's some examples of what comes out of those studies for two of the diagnostic protocols that we've been running. One of them is focused on neurological presentations, both in childhood and in adults, and the other is focused on um, undiagnosed diseases of various kinds, typically in children. And I just summarized here, and I won't walk through it, what the diagnostic yield is for more than about 1,000 uh, patients that we've sequenced, and just emphasize that, of course, the diagnostic yield is lower in adults uh, than it is in children. Uh, it's um, also, um, of course, dependent on whether you actually have the parents. We do better when we have the parents than when we don't have the, uh, the, the parents. Overall, for the uh, neurological presentations I'll be talking about now from here on, uh, the diagnostic yield is something like 10%. That's because we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of adults. I'll make a quick comment about having the parents in these kinds of analyses. Um, that used to be extremely important to have the parents in these kinds of analyses. It still is somewhat important, but actually far less important than it used to be. And the reason is uh, because of the growing size of population scale sequence data. Because what you're actually doing when you're using the parents is identifying only the most recent mutations to focus particular attention on. When you have very, very large population samples that you have sequence data for, you can actually do almost exactly the same thing. Because in fact, we know, for example, for European ancestry, if you filter on absence in the databases, you get down mostly to private variants that are restricted to very close uh, relatives. Uh, so, so eventually, we actually can perform this pretty well even without the, uh, the parents. Okay, so now a little bit about what we do after we find the um, genetic cause of disease in individual patients. What we've actually set up, and because there's a primary uh, focus on the functional biology side on neuropsychiatric diseases, we've set up a variety of modeling paradigms that will help us reveal the effects of mutations that we hope reveal effects that are relevant to how the mutations actually cause disease in a variety of experimental settings, emphasizing in particular animal models, and uh, for those that don't know the uh, field well, epilepsy is actually particularly well modeled in mice. It doesn't mean that it's easily modeled, it's just well modeled in comparison to some other uh, presentations. Uh, and we've also emphasized the number of cellular models, in particular single cell and cultured neuronal network models, uh, so that we can actually have a model of intermediate complexity, which I think for a lot of these mutations is of particular importance, where we can actually have a model that can reveal even complex effects of mutations such, such as on the behavior of synapses, uh, but still have a model that is amenable to screening a number of compounds to see what compounds might actually work specifically for the effects of those mutations. So under the leadership of Wayne Frankel and Mike Boland at the, uh, at the Institute, we've set up these modeling paradigms, and we've been using them now to try to actually understand the effects of individual mutations that cause disease in individual patients and to find treatments that are appropriate for those exact causes of disease. And of course, the hope is then to bring those treatments back to the patients that we've diagnosed at, at Columbia. So I want to first uh, uh, detour briefly to work that was done in partnership with a company. And let me make a disclaimer that I have a commercial interest in this company. Um, but sometimes this work is actually relatively easy. And when it's relatively easy, is when you have an established modeling paradigm that allows you to isolate the effect of the mutation and screen on the effect of the mutation. And it really is important to keep in mind that some of these genetic conditions can be studied like that, creating near-term near accessible opportunities for targeted treatments. And it really is striking to me that there's a number of these out there that have not been systematically explored for potential targeted treatment. So it really is a high priority. So our experience with this involves uh, a model uh, that we created for the mutations that cause an epileptic encephalopathy in the SCN8A gene. It had already been established in the literature that de novo mutations in the gene cause epilepsy and that the de novo mutations are activating increasing current uh, mediated by the channel. Uh, we uh, 
uh, replicated those results on one of the mutations that um, uh, is shown to cause an epileptic encephalopathy. And of course, because the mutation is activating, what we then did is just screen to find inhibitors. We actually screened, in order to identify repurposing opportunities, a panel of FDA-approved drugs. And we actually found that a handful of drugs provide very strong inhibition of the mutant form of the channel. Um, now, I don't know anything firsthand about whether uh, some of the leads that came out of this have actually been helpful in patients uh, or not. One of the drugs identified is amitriptyline, which would be relatively straightforward to try um, because, it's because it's known to be relatively safe uh, in children, where you often find this presentation. But what this does illustrate is that even focusing only on a panel of already approved drugs, a very narrow list of compounds to test, you actually find relatively strong inhibitors. And so for um, proteins like SCN8A, where there are established assays to isolate the relevant effect of the mutation, we really do have the opportunity, once we perform these kinds of screens, of identifying potentially uh, targeted treatments that can be used once you actually know that the patient has epilepsy because of activating mutations. I actually think it's really important that one way or another, either in academia or in pharma or uh, biotech or some collaboration, I think it's really important that we actually perform appropriate screens on all of these kinds of proteins, specifically for the mutant form, to find those potential targeted treatments. Unfortunately, a lot of the genetic causes of disease that we find are actually much more challenging than that where we actually don't know an assay to run that isolates the effect of the mutation so that we can actually simply do something like a large screen on the activated ion channel. An example of that that we've been working on uh, is um, a, a neurodevelopmental disorder that we actually found the gene for as part of the diagnostic sequencing work that I just described at Columbia, where germline de novo mutations in GNB1 uh, caused this uh, uh, severe uh, uh, neurodevelopmental condition involving hypotonia and, and often seizures uh, and often um, qu quite serious uh, intellectual impairment. Uh, we identified first four patients at Columbia and then rapidly, as often happens now, uh, patients were identified elsewhere and, uh, and a, a report has now uh, been published both introducing the gene and also uh, describing the, um, the presentation uh, of, uh, of uh, this uh, GNB1 uh, syndrome. And after we discovered the genetic basis, we started working to try to understand how mutations in this uh, gene encoding uh, a beta G protein actually cause disease. And of course, the challenge is G protein signaling is very complicated. And based on the mutations themselves spread through the gene, we have absolutely no idea what aspect of G protein signaling is actually most relevant to the presentation. So we don't know what aspect to focus on therapeutically. And so we set up these models that I described earlier, where we use CRISPR to create a mouse model. We're creating uh, stem cell-based models where we can study human um, uh, neurons with the mutation. And we're also taking primary cells out of the mouse model, growing them in culture so that we can actually monitor the behavior of cultured neuronal networks in order to see if we can see some kind of a distinguishing phenotype in those cultured neuronal networks for the mutant uh, model compared to wild type. And fortunately, we actually have been able to identify such a phenotype for the uh, GNB1 mutant primary uh, mouse cells. And it's a very, very clear bursting phenotype, where if, I won't go through the details here, but what we're doing is culturing some tens of thousands of primary neurons, and then we're monitoring um, their activity in, in culture with multi-electrode arrays. And what you can actually see is that you get more concentrated firing of neurons over short periods of time in the mutant network in comparison to the wild type network. And this is, of course, exactly what we hope to see, because if we see a, a feature like that, then we can screen compounds to try to revert that feature back towards wild type and hope that any compounds that we identify that have uh, efficacy for the phenotype in vitro will also have efficacy in vivo, and then of course can be candidates that we can try um, clinically. So that's the hope. Before I actually walk through this, of course I've chosen to tell you this story because there's some good parts to this story, but before I do that, let me just say that I have picked out the best such example that we have, and we have been doing a lot of this, okay, and we have 
no other one that's as good as this. And we have plenty of examples where we don't see anything at all. It's actually not easy to do this kind of work. I do not want to imply that for a minute. But this one actually I have picked out because I th we believe the results and I do think that it is encouraging that this can at least happen even if it takes a long time and does not always work. In any event, we actually see this clear bursting phenotype in the cultured neuronal networks. Um, and we tried a number of anti-epileptic drugs to see if we could actually revert that um, phenotype in the cultured neuronal networks. So what you actually see here um, is a, a, a display illustrating the bursting phenotype. You see the normal mouse, uh, uh, the mutant mouse model, and then the effect of one anti-epileptic drug, uh, ethosuximide, on the mutant uh, uh, cultures. And what you actually see is that the bursting phenotypes, a more concentrated firing over a short period of time, um, is actually uh, reduced very substantially by ethosuximide in this cultured neuronal network. Uh, a few other anti-epileptic drugs that we tried uh, do not revert the phenotype nearly as much as this, suggesting the possibility uh, that, that in some way that we don't currently yet understand, ethosuximide is actually acting on the effects of the mutation to push the behavior of the network back towards wild type. Now, most encouraging of all, uh, the, the mice actually do have absence-like seizures. And so we can actually take the compound that has the effect in the cultured neuronal networks, we can go back to the mouse and ask what that compound does in the mouse, and then we actually see precisely the recapitulation that we were hoping for, um, where we see um, a clear EEG signature uh, in the, uh, in the um, mutant model uh, before treatment, and it is completely normalized, in fact, by ethosuximide treatment. Uh, this is work that's run by uh, Sophie Colombo, a postdoc uh, uh, in the lab, and she's been working on it now, I think, for about two and a half years. So I think this is actually a really encouraging news that this can work, but it is actually a very great deal of work for every single condition. This uh, GMB1 neurodevelopmental uh, uh, syndrome, we probably know in the world about 30 or 40 patients, and we're talking about a couple of people working two and a half years more or less full time on that to get to this point. So we can make progress, and I think it's very important that we do, uh, but we have to actually be realistic that it's a tremendous amount of time and work for every one of these that we take on. Uh, we're pursuing a, a, a broad range of these kinds of models uh, in the institute. We have hints of progress in a number of them. For those that are interested, I've actually listed out some of the ones that are work, being worked on substantially by the team in the institute. We have hints of progress in, in a number of these, but as I said, nothing as uh, uh, strong and as clear uh, as for GNB1. Uh, I want to finally turn to uh, maybe some encouraging news uh, about the challenge of actually developing this kind of paradigm to treatment where we're targeting treatment to the underlying causes of disease. Two big questions about that are, one, how in the world do you run the trials? If the diseases are so rare, we're we really talking about a model where you have to scan uh, 30, 40 different academic medical centers to get those patients that happen to have uh, the mutation in the right gene. And then the other challenge is, uh, how many patients can these treatments really apply to, and is there an ec economic model for drug development? So on the first question, how challenging will it be to actually run trials where you're targeting to the actual cause of disease? I think it might not be quite as difficult as uh, some were expecting. Um, we've now been running these systematic genomic uh, discovery efforts in uh, neuropsychiatric and other disease presentations for several years in Columbia, and we've summarized here the work that uh, a postdoc in the group, Nick Stong, has done. We've summarized here the diagnoses at one academic medical center in genes that have more than one diagnosis. And what's really striking is that for a lot of genes that cause very rare diseases, at one academic medical center, we have many diagnoses. So SCN1A, which is uh, responsible for the most common epileptic encephalopathy, we've actually seen 10 pathogenic mutations in in one academic medical center. SCN2A, a very important gene for both epilepsy and autism, we've seen seven, et cetera. When you keep in mind that for some of these neurodevelopmental diseases, we know that the clinical trials will be quite small because, for example, patients have frequent seizures and you can actually test for efficacy in small numbers of patients. This actually suggests that it might be possible to run these kinds of targeted trials by partnering with just two or three ac academic medical centers instead of having to find one patient at each of, of uh, 15 or 20. Uh, the last uh, point that I want to make is that the 
domain of application of these kinds of targeted treatments might actually be just a little bit broader than we were an anticipating, thinking about the number of uh, patients that just have the uh, rare devastating diseases where these genes have first been discovered. And we've been doing some work as part of the Epi4K consortium that I think establishes a very clear connection uh, between the genetics of rare and devastating epilepsies and the genetics of more common, less devastating epilepsies. So for the non-neurologists, the more common uh, forms of epilepsy, often adult onset, often not so severe, are genetic generalized epilepsy and non-acquired focal epilepsy. Um, and what we did now a while back is look at the uh, pattern of rare variation in patients with genetic generalized epilepsy and non-acquired focal ep epilepsy compared to controls. And without going through the details of how these analyses work, what we found is that a number of genes have a clear excess of rare functional variation uh, in the epilepsy, uh, in the common epilepsy patients uh, in comparison to controls. And some of those uh, genes I've highlighted here in blue. And what's striking is that all the genes uh, that are at the top of the most enriched genes for rare functional variation in the patients with these more common epilepsies all of them are already known epilepsy genes that cause familial or more devastating epilepsy. So we get this very clear connection between the genetics of the rarer forms of epilepsy and the more common forms of epilepsy. And I think this raises at least the possibility that a subset of the patients with the more common presentations can actually select and appropriately treat with the treatments that are targeted to the genetic causes of the rare epilepsies. And this is actually, I think, a really high priority to work out how this is actually working, whether the mutations that are, resp are responsible for these less severe epilepsies are different from the ones in the same gene that causes the more severe epilepsies. So in conclusion, um, we really do have a, a, a new paradigm emerging uh, that's fueled by genomic di diagnostics of targeting treatments uh, to the underlying mechanism of disease revealed by genomic diagnoses. Uh, but when that is not immediately obvious and available, it's very hard work to find those targeted treatments, and that has to be a real focus. And I would like to suggest, uh, because we're here at the PGRN, that we really should appropriately view this as a kind of subset of pharmacogenetics that's focused, of, of course, on the pharm pharmacodynamics side. Um, and then the other point I was just making, that this paradigm really might be applicable to more common forms of rare diseases, which I think is a really interesting thing for us to, uh, to evaluate and determine if it's right. And uh, I think I've acknowledged that people have actually done the work as I went through, but others are here. And thank you very much for your attention. So uh, we do have a panel discussion uh, after, uh, uh, at the end of the session, but uh, any burning questions now? Uh, David has kept to time. Uh, great, great talk. Uh, so I'm interested in the uh, kind of trade-off between the IPSC models versus the mice. And you were saying, you know, the examples you're showing are sort of the exceptions, right, where you do, are able to find something. So. Do you generally find you have more luck with the IPSCs? I'm assuming in the mice it's easier to see phenotypes. Yeah, so the trade-off is that um, the IPSCs are, are human cells, and that's better. Uh, and the mouse, mouse primary cells are far easier to work with. I mean, that's really what it comes down to, because we, we, have, much, uh, we have many fewer sources of uncontrolled variation and outcome in the mouse primary cells. So we actually see much more consistent phenotypic effects there than we see in, in, the, in the stem cell derived hum, human neurons because it's very difficult for us to get con consistency. And in terms of how often you see sort of in vivo versus in vitro phenotypes? That that's, that's been rare, uh, yeah. So it's, yeah, that's been rare, yeah. Okay, well thank you very much David and we'll pick this up in the, later on.